Okay, so welcome back to Romance Studies at 202. Um, today, we're going to talk about um, this book, Georges Perec, W or the Memory of Childhood. And I'm very, very pleased to have with me um, my colleague, um, Professor Vincent Gelina Lemaire, who is Professor of French here in uh, French Hispanic Italian Studies at UBC. Thanks so much for taking this time uh, to talk to um, us about uh, Perec. And uh, just as a first open question, uh, how would you first start to approach this rather strange little book? Well, thank you for inviting me to your class. It's a pleasure to talk about uh, Perec. Um, first, of all, first of all, I think we need to acknowledge it's it's a book that is quite difficult to um, piece together. It is, it is absolutely normal to feel a bit lost because we have two narratives, uh, two, two quests unfolding at the same time. Uh, they don't follow the same patterns. They don't have the same codes, but we know because they've been edited together that are supposed to complement each other. Um, Perec usually is a very rational and mathematical uh, thinker. So he never does anything by accident. Everything is planned, organized, and made to fit. So we, we can trust that it is that there is some logic and the madness here, um, but that may not be helping us much while we're reading the book. Uh, I would say um, it is important to read it as organically as we can. So not be stumped by trying to piece out how each part works with another at every point of the book, but try to fluidly advance because what counts is not so much each moment, but the trajectory where Perec is trying to lead us. And both stories are evolving along different um, lines and get more intense as we advance through the book. The, um, the storyline on the island becomes more and more explicitly um, from a departure that seemed to touch on uh, Thomas More's utopia. So an old source that, that is meant to represent a perfect world. And there's some explicit references. The island is shaped like a mutton's skull, while Utopia and more is a human skull. So there's a bit of a disjunction here, but it, but more and more, if we're careful, we understand that something is wrong in this island. Everything is organized, but too organized, too precise. And if you know a bit of the background of uh, 20th century Europe, you would recognize some explicit more and more references to the concentration camps. And it's useful to know that Perec lost uh, his mother and some other family members and, uh, and the Holocaust. So um, during World War II, uh, his family came from Poland. He changes, they changed their name to, from Peretz uh, to Perec to sound Breton, so French, but this, that did not protect them. And Perec was saved as an infant or as a young child um, by being shipped to the free zone of France while his mother stayed behind. So that is our second storyline. And if you know a bit about, about his background, you understand already how heavy and charged it is. And it is not explicitly about his mother only, but it's about the quest of reconstructing memory. And he doesn't use the same tools as Proust would. Um, he, he tries to find in space and objects, clues and, um, Mem echoes of the past and it is meant to be a, a lost cause Perec will work, work his whole life at trying to find uh, traces of his past of his of his family's past in Paris and one of the signs of this frustration and the it's named briefly in the book when um, uh, Perec's mother's hairdresser salon is mentioned there is a street in Paris uh, Rue Villain that was where all his childhood was built and the street was demolished. So Perec is meant to never be able to find back his, his youth and the truth of his family. Everything has been laid to ruins and built back on top of this past. So that is in, in a shell what Perec does and he constructs stories and inventions around always this, um, this, this uh, core of of a doubtful and maybe constructed memory of his youth. There's, there's, thanks so much for that, Vincent. So there's so much in what you've uh, in what you've just said, uh, which is fascinating. So one of the one of the things um, that you've highlighted then is, I guess, this this is this is a returning right 
uh, this sort of repetition, which we see played out in the book in, in lots of different ways, in the fact that it's got two stories, um, in the fact that, for instance, there are two Gaspard Winklers, there's lots of doubling, right? And even within the book, there's some of his previous texts that he's reworking and, and returning to, and, and yet acknowledging that, um, that, that that doesn't bring any assurance, right? That, that in some ways he's seeking some kind of something more solid, but the more he returns to the same materials, the photographs, the memories, and so on and so forth, in, in some ways, the less he can be sure. W would you would you see that that's part of the process of, of what's happening? Yes, and um, we whenever we, we read a certain books by Perec, we have to we have to accompany him in his quest. And there's repetitions. There's a bit of um, uh, it can they can seem fruitless. And they are, but the process of trying to to go back to the same places, to look for the same clues over and over again, is very natural. Um, we're not rational, purely rational beings who, once we don't find something, we just accept it. Uh, there is something of uh, Sherlock Holmes and uh, Perec. He, he wants to keep looking at the clue and hope that there is something that will unfold. And his whole. Um, Everything is written keeps turning around the same obsessions, like we do. We have our own course that we um, we we circulate, and there's many echoes in the book. So the book itself is a two two stories that are contained and with some echoes between them. And if you continue reading Perec, you will see the echoes multiplying and repetitions coming back and the same places coming so, so often that we don't know what we've read from Perec and one book. And there is a clue at, the, at, the, at the, um, the top of the book. The book is dedicated to E. Um, and we don't have the clues, to the, the solution to find it. And if I remember well, it's dedicated to his, we, we can read it as being dedicated to his aunt who um, saved him during the war. But E is also a link to a book he wrote called A Void, um, La Disparition, The Disappearance in which it's it's a well-known book and it's um 300 pages without the letter e um and it's become an obsession by translator to transform to absorb them and sort of that challenge into different books and it can seem like a gimmick like a, a once again Perec trying to create a puzzle but it is about what's lacking so he can write a whole novel without ever saying what's not there um and that is the only solution he has. It's he cannot find uh, an answer. He can just make us under thing, uh, understand what's lacking, where his memory is faulty, where where it will never be filled. And of course, he is a sign of all he's lost, including his family. Again, there's so much there. Uh, that's that's part of, uh, about the Sherlock Holmes thing. I was actually thinking as, as re -re when I was rereading it that there's. Um, especially when he meets or when Gaspard Winkler in the Gaspard Winkler story, he meets this, this strange guy, Otto Appelstaum or, or something like that. I forget what exactly his name is. And he comes into the bar and just like Sherlock Holmes, he's trying to piece together the signs, right? To figure out what's going on through what, what he can see. So this interpretation of these little details, right? Of, of, of everyday life. And, and actually that's something we were talking about before um, when we were discussing what we might talk about. There's something you, um, thought uh, that you mentioned is important. Th this interest in, in, in the details. I, I wonder if you could say a, a little bit more about that, either here or you also mentioned another book by Perrick, in, in, yes. in, which is all about the, the, the details of everyday life. So you, you will notice in the, in the one of the two storylines, one is more is describes a system and one des describes objects, places owned by Perec. So there's a lot of description of the minute, so uh, a street with no specific of no specific interest, Rue Villain. There's pictures, there's um, there's some objects being described, uh, memories of, of friends. So a, a lot of um, incomplete or um, or or details, or, or details that may seem um, of very little value, like a, a scar. Uh, but let's a, a scar in itself is of no interest. It's a it's a simple mark on the skin. Um, but of course, for Perec, it is the site of a memory. He can look at the scar and unfold a bit, like Proust could with the Madeleine. He can unfold uh, 
all of a, of a memory line from this little sign um, that he finds. And that's why not having the place of his youth is such a problem. He cannot go tap, awake, awaken this memory. So he, he does that. He, he plays with the, this, the value of the detail and the, the, the mundane the, to, to prove to us that in fact, it's highly significant. So that other book I, was, um, I had in mind is called An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris. And it sounds like the most boring uh, premise possible. Perec decided to just sit at a, at a cafe in Paris for three days, take a, a notebook and describe everything you would see here or ob observe except for the monuments. So everything that we would not notice, buses, tourists, uh, patterns, and an old lady that goes to the same shop every day and brings back always the same things, um, maybe there's an event like uh, two lovers that are meeting, but each of those details are very minute. Um, and because Perec is such a master of the puzzle, Winkler is a puzzle maker and another story, by the way, um, we, we can start seeing patterns in the city around him. We can see his own obsessions because even if he's looking at everything, he still needs to filter and even read, read through his boredom, and it makes for a very engrossing storyline. And that, that is what Perec called the infraordinary. So it's not extraordinary, it's not superheroes, it's the opposite. It's finding meaning, finding interest, and finding literary material, and what is the smallest. And Perec was a cross, uh, wrote crosswords and wrote little games, so he, he keeps hiding clues everywhere. So you have to be an active reader to enjoy Perec. You have to look for clues, patterns, repetitions, and, and, and remind them to remind, to put them together. It's, um, I, I was, I was thinking about what you were saying about the going without saying, and, and this notion of the active reader, because I, I mean, I've read avoid, I've read it in, in English. The translator's job was, I, I don't know, Gilbert Adair translated it. And it's, it's quite amazing that he translated it into an English without um, the E. But there's sort of a, a game there because in order to read it, you have to, you, you you have to ignore the fact in part that there's no e, right? If you if you're always obsessing about the fact that there's no e, then then you can never continue onwards. You, you, and there's a point at which you forget, or you at least briefly forget uh, uh, the constraints that Perec has set up. This extraordinary constraint that that he set up in order to produce this. So, um, and again, that's something we talked about earlier about this sort of uh, play between or tension between constraints, setting themselves these rules, setting themselves sort of these tasks, even like the one you were just saying, I'll sit in this cafe for three days and, and this is what I'll do. This is sort of a, a plan, a, a program. And then the, the freedom that he manages to bring out from within those rules and, and within those constraints. I, I don't know if you'd like to say a little bit more about that. Yes, I, I agree completely. It's we we would think that the the more liberty we have to write, the the more creative it will be. But I've tried the experiment in the past, and let, let's say I as a, as a student, as a writer, anyone you you're told write a story. It it is it is very difficult to 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 find a place to start, and we will since we don't have any anything to any foundation, we'll, we'll try to come up with something from scratch. So we'll probably take patterns we know, and we'll end up rewriting what we already know. So Perec, to break this, decided to do the opposite, work through constraints. And that's the Ulipo, um, in which uh, a, a movement in a, uh, a group of people that, including mathematicians, that decided to create through constraints. So Perec was a genius in that he was able to push these constraints to absurd lengths and to work through and, and around them so well that it would be undistinguishable while creating new objects. Some of the critics of uh, Avoid, let's Parisien, originally did not notice the letter E was missing. How, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. The 300 pages without the letter E, you would notice something is askew, but he managed to work through them. So there is a lot that when we're forced to break our patterns because of constraints will we'll change. And I, I proposed the exercise to some students and one of them decided to go sit in a bar for eight hours, just noting everything she saw. 
And people were weirded out. Why are you just sitting there and jutting down? There's nothing happening. And at first she was doubting herself, but after the, the day of, of writing, she she was energized. She had found patterns she would never have cared to, to see because she would be looking at her phone or talking with friends. And it produced a new depth of field that she didn't have. And Beck is a genius that way, that he can, the, the, the less liberty he has, the more he can take out of it. And then just to conclude, because we can draw this to a close, I want to pick up on, on something you said um, uh, a, a little while ago about the gimmick, right? So first sight, um, uh, many of Perrick's books can perhaps seem a little gimmicky, right? I mean, th that's the, there's a whole book about a theory of the gimmick, actually, which I haven't read yet, which is meant to be um, very good. I forget who it's by. It's a recent book, but that's another thing. So they can see, uh, they can seem a little sort of gimmicky. He's, he's, he's doing this thing, and there's, there's no particular reason obvious reason why he should why he should um you know put, put these kind of constraints on himself or or write in this sort of torturous way or put it take on these impossible tasks but it seems to me at least that we can see in w and perhaps elsewhere but perhaps particularly in in, in w that there's something deadly serious right in the end it, it's you know there were camps right there was a holocaust um uh, there were in which Millions of people died, including Perrick's uh, uh, relatives, that he wants to approach whilst knowing that you can never fully, you can never fully understand it, perhaps, or never fully touch it. And this, this sense of uh, approaching, but recognizing um, that there is something beyond, beyond, beyond sense in some ways, right? That, that seems to be at the heart of this. Would you, uh, I don't know if, if, if that makes, if, if you agree with, with that take on things. It does, and and there is, it, it's it's a, one of the things that I find surprising here is that um, if Perec and, and the storyline on the island man, moves between those utopia and dystopia, it's a, it's opposite, and he uses codes that we think as positive, or uh, we we care about rules in sports. If someone from the other team does a foul and no one says anything, you you'll be upset. You want you want the, the umpire to stop the game and set everyone straight. Uh, if someone is doped at the Olympics, it creates a scandal. Everyone is frustrated. The game is tarnished. So we want those rules. We want everything to be to be laid in boxes. So we like the constraints. And Perec, here is what is, is interesting, is that what's happening in the island is, is, is an overplay of constraints, the games and lives that are um, controlled to the in every little possible way through time and space. Um, so he over-organizes uh, the world, and but he slowly, he slowly switches the, the tonality. What at first seems exhilarating, the, the contest, the sports, um, falls into something uh, much darker. So while things are very organized and very precise, he's able to modulate what we're supposed to to feel so at the end what at about the the, the half, half of the book you should start feeling that something is wrong and but it, it's very subtle and it's it's slow and you, um but it's Perec, of course is self-conscious about the how mathematics geometry uh, control rules were parts not only of, of his creation but also of the totalitarian state uh, so he's thinking through it actively and is um, in his writing here. So if, if you need a, a guide and, and reading, you can think about rules or about control or about precision. How is it um, defined? And what's their value? Is, is precision or rules positive, negatives? Are they helping? Uh, Berek or so, so that is one of the centers of the book. Right. And how order comes out of chaos. The order may not be simply opposed to chaos. But uh, or barbarism, in fact, more than chaos, right? Can yes. come out of uh, come out of order. Well, thank you so much for this, Vincent. This has been um, a fantastic conversation uh, about a fascinating book, and I really appreciate your time and your expertise um, to help us think about it a little bit further. Thank you so much. Thank you, John.